Good morning. Well, you turn your Bibles with me to the book of 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. It's certainly great seeing everyone out this morning. We're thankful that the rain didn't keep you in, but you were able to get here safely. And of course, we're prayerful and hopeful anyone else that may be on their way will arrive safely. And I'm hoping that everyone had a, a great week this past week. I, I know Mitzi and I did. We spent some time last night with some of our, our friends uh, seeing the, a movie over at the new Kenner Theater. And, and that was a, a lot of fun. And, and Wednesday night, uh, we had actually been given some tickets to the Pelicans game. And so we know it's a, uh, it's a school night. But what we do and whenever we get free tickets, we never want to pass them up. And so what, right after church on Wednesday night, we headed down to the arena. And the good thing about getting there for the third quarter is that the parking attendant has already left their spot. So we get some free parking. We've got this down to a routine. We go in. We watch the third quarter. The Pelicans are winning the entire third quarter and we leave just in time for them to lose the game and we find out when we get home that they've lost by a couple of points and that tends to that tends to to go uh, that way but in New Orleans uh, as we are looking at what the Pelicans are doing and not too impressed we still keep our eyes on the New Orleans Saints and this past week it was an awesome thing that the Saints said bye-bye to Malcolm Jenkins and they said hello to Jairus Bird, the number one safety in the NFL. They picked this guy up on free agency. And, and Steve DeShazer, local sports writer, had this to say about this free agency move by the New Orleans Saints. The first day of NFL free agency for the Saints proved to be a bountiful, shocking, set the NFL above a buzz one. It was, in essence, a game-changing pick six. The Saints intercepted any thoughts that they wouldn't be major players in free agency and turned in one of the biggest scores of the day Tuesday, signing the most coveted safety on the market, three-time All-Pro and unrestricted free agent Jarris Bird to a six-year contract. Bird upgrades the position in the league's second-ranked pass defense as a five-year veteran who will enter with the 2014 season with 22 interceptions, 33 passes defensed, 11 forced fumbles, and five fumble recoveries. That compliment is no slight to Malcolm Jenkins, who spent his first five seasons with the Saints before signing as an unrestricted free agent himself. The Shazer goes on to say, the bottom line is that Bird is arguably the top safety in the league, a three-time pro bowler who has stood out in Buffalo since being drafted in the second round. I can't tell you how excited I am about the signing of this free agent, Jarris Bird. I went and, and thumbed around through his Facebook page, and this fella is one that has Bible verses as his status updates and other Christian type themes. And I'm thinking, man, how awesome of a guy this is, and, and this is a really first class kind of guy. This morning, our lesson is titled, Living in Free Agency. Now, I don't know if any one of us will ever make it to the NFL. I don't believe that I will, but maybe some of our our younger guys, they might. But what we need to understand is that we are all free agents living in this world. We have the ability to choose how we will live our lives spiritually, relationally, and morally before our God and before others. This morning, for your consideration, I'd like to make two main points. One dealing with what God has done, and the second dealing with what we must do. First of all, as we turn our attention over to the book of 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 10, we're noticing that God has chosen. He already has chosen. 
Scripture says this, 1 Peter 2, verse 4. Coming to Him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious, But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble, being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people but now are the people of God, who had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy. As we think about living as free agents in the world today, What we need to know up front is that God has already chosen who would be saved and who would be lost. Now, don't get too far ahead now because the idea is that this is not an individual thing, but a group thing. And so what that means is that God has chosen who would be saved. And those who would be saved are those who accept the God's plan of salvation. Those who accept the idea of being Christians. And those who accept being a part of the Lord's church. You see, there's all kinds of false teachings around us in our religious world. And many of them go back to the the old John Calvin doctrine, uh, conveniently known as TULIP. The word TULIP being the acronym for uh, total depravity and unconditional election. For example, there's a lot of our religious friends that believe that God... Before the foundation of the world, arbitrarily chose some people to be saved, and he chose others to be lost before they ever even lived. And that nothing could be done to change God's decision. And corresponding with that, the idea of limited atonement. Some of our friends believe that Jesus Christ only only died for the ones that God had already chosen before they were even born into the world. And then some folks misbelieve or are based upon a misbelief. They think that since man can do nothing but good or evil on his own, that God's election is required to save him. Consequently, he needs to do nothing to remain safe. It's this idea that that God, this false idea, that God has already chosen who would be lost and who would be saved. He has, but it has to do with groups as far as the church and those who are outside of the church. If we follow this John Calvin way of thinking out a little bit, I'm sure that occasion you might be sitting there, sitting in the in the church pew and wondering, well, if this election is the way it goes, it, did God choose me to be lost or did God choose me to be saved? And there are a lot of people that are sitting somewhere right now in the world trying to figure out if they were one of the ones that were chosen before this world world even existed. You see, although all of that, though, is bizarre, it's false. 
You see, God did not individually choose who would be saved or lost. However, God did choose a group of people to be saved and a group of people to be lost. The group that will be saved is the church. The church, the, the, the institution, the group of people that Christ died for. The group that will be lost is those outside of the church. You see, Paul says it this way over in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 4. That is, God is, it is God who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God would truly not desire all men to be saved if some were already determined to be lost. You see, each and every one of us have the opportunity to choose. And this is leading us to our second point this morning. Yes, God has chosen the church to be saved. However, we still must choose individually if we want to be a part of the church. We still must choose individually if we want to be a part of this chosen nation, this holy priesthood, this elect group of people, the Lord's church. The principle of God's people choosing has permeated Scripture both in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Would you turn your Bible for the moment with me back to the Old Testament, to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 30. We're going to notice verses 15 through 20. And in Deuteronomy chapter 30, God's people, the Israelites, had a choice to make. They're they're right on the brink, on the verge of entering into the promised land of Canaan. They've wandered around the wilderness over and over again, and God has given them chance after chance after chance to get it right and, and to do what they need to do. And in Deuteronomy 30, verses 15 through 20, God reminds them again, kind of like a broken record player, of what they need to do and who they need to choose and what will happen if they do and when or if they don't. I'm in Deuteronomy chapter 30, beginning in verse 15. Scripture says, See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. In that I command you today to love your God, to walk in His ways, and to keep His commandments, His statutes, and His judgments, that you may live and multiply. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you will go to possess. That, of course, being the promised land of Canaan. But if your heart turns away so that you do not hear, and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to go in and possess. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, notice the end of verse 19, therefore choose life that both you and your descendants may live. That you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, and that you may cling to him, for he is your life and the length of your days, and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, to give to them. You see, Moses is talking with them via the Lord's message, and he's telling God's people, hey, you have a choice. 
He's telling them, now wait, God has already decided those who are going to be receiving blessings and those who are going to be receiving cursings, those who will experience life, those who will experience death. Those who are obedient are going to be the ones that God has chosen to receive blessings. And those, however, that are disobedient to God are going to experience the the cursing or a, a spiritual death before our God. But he tells them very specifically, the choice is yours. No one else can make that choice for you. Your forefathers couldn't make it. Those coming right out of the Egyptian bondage, the, the people in the future can't make that decision for you. God can't make that decision. Moses can't make that decision. But you... Israelites have to make that decision. You need to choose for yourself who you will serve. And that's exactly what Joshua had told the people of God as after his long ministry and successful ministry and as the people of God were already living faithfully in the, the promised land of Canaan, Joshua concludes his legacy by telling the people, Therefore, fear the Lord... Serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river. Serve the Lord. And it's, if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose, Joshua says, for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods your father served there that were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now dwell. But for me and my house, Joshua says, we will serve the Lord. That was a decision that Joshua had made. That was a choice that he had made for he and his household, that they were going to live faithfully to God as far as he would, could help it, and as far as he was able and living to provide spiritual leadership to his family. And over in the book of James, chapter 1, turning now to the New Testament, we learn more uh, about this idea that we have the opportunity to choose. You see, some people say, well, I, I, I sin and I just can't help it. it. This is just a part of who I am and I have no control over it. But notice what the Bible says in James chapter 1, verses 12 through 15. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which I, or which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. You see, we are living as free agents who have the opportunity to choose if we are going to live for God and be a part of His church, the elect, the chosen nation, or if we are going to be a part of the world who is lost. You see, having this idea of free moral agency it is a large part of what it means to be a person. A computer, for example, this is not a free agent. A computer can only do exactly what it is programmed to do. It does not have the ability to do anything on its own. 
Imagine also if there was millions and millions of dominoes that were laid across all throughout this church building. And they're all lined up right after each other. And one person knocks over the first domino. What's going to happen to all the rest of those dominoes? They, of course, are going to fall down. They have no choice. They have no free agency. They cannot choose to do something different. But you see, the way that we are created by God and in His design, we are so much more than just pre-programmed computers. And we're so much more than any type of detrimental, deterministic type of domino falling with no control whatsoever. The fact is we have been created in the image of God. And we have the ability to choose. Free moral agency is the ability we have to choose one way or the other. To live according to the dictates of the material world or to choose to transcend those dictates so as to be something more than simply a natural product such as a a domino or a computer. And this is why the tulip doctrine is so bizarre. That old way of thinking that became known as Calvinism about unconditional election and perseverance of the saints and, and all of those things. That's all bizarre because all that says is that we would be nothing more than pre-wired dominoes falling in place one after the other. But we're more than that. We are created in the image of God. And He has created us in such a way that we can choose who we will live for and we can choose if that will be our God. Kyle Budd over at the Apologetics Press has this to say about how God has created us sinless, but also giving us the capacity to choose between right and wrong. Kyle Budd writes, the real question is this, is God capable of creating a being with genuine free will? There is no valid reason to conclude that God cannot create a totally free moral agent who can originate his his or her own desires that are not a part of his or her original composition. It's like a company producing the perfect car. And by the way, if you find that company, let me know. But it's like a company that produces the perfect car that worked perfect all the time. But that would not stop a person from driving that perfect car off the cliff or or doing something silly or ridiculous such as that. You see, Kyle Buck continues, The Bible offers clear evidence to the conclusion that evil desires and imperfection were concocted by humanity's free moral agency and were not a part of the original creation. James 1.14 states, and we've just noticed, each is tempted and when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. The phrase, his own desires, indicates that each person originates such evil desires And they are not inherent in his makeup or forced upon him by his creator. We mentioned earlier about Jairus Bird being a free agent and how he had the power to choose. And from what I understand, we were the first visit that he made. He came to New Orleans, first team visit, and he signed before he left town. He had the choice and the freedom to do that, and he certainly did. But another fellow that we've come to love so much did not end up in that same situation. Darren Sproles, who is one of my, was one of my favorite Saints players for a variety of reasons, including his height. But, J- but Darren Sproles, he was asking and begging the Saints to release him as a free agent. But the Saints did not want to release him as a free agent because they wanted to trade him. 
You see, Sproles wanted to be a free agent so that he could choose where he would end up next football season and that he would have more of a say on how his future would unfold. But you see, Sproles was not a free agent. Rather, he was contained and he was traded and he had no say-so in the matter. You see, as we think about our lives living in this world today, we are much more like Jairus Bird than we are Darren Sproles. Darren Sproles had no choice in the matter. He had to end up in Philadelphia. But Jairus Bird got to choose because he was a free agent. And you and I, in our lives, in our relationships with each other, and in our relationship with God, no one is keeping us from doing anything. Rather, we have the ability to choose, and we are free agents in that regard. As we close this morning, and as we are seeking application... There's a couple of psychiatrists that wrote wrote a book entitled, Happiness is a Choice. And it's interesting what they said in reflection of some of their patients. These folks wrote, as psychiatrists, we cringe whenever Christian patients use the words, I can't and I've tried. Any good psychiatrist knows that I can't and I've tried are merely lame excuses. We insist that our patients stop saying can't and say won't instead. They need to see what they are really doing, so we make them face face up to it by saying, I just won't get along with my spouse. My husband and I won't communicate. I won't discipline my kids the way that I should. I won't find time to pray. I won't stop gossiping. And they conclude by saying when they change their can'ts to won'ts, they stop avoiding the truth and start facing reality. You see, we're faced every single day with all kinds of false truths, all kinds of lies that tell us that it doesn't matter what we do or say because we really don't have the choice to do so. Sometimes we'll hear others say, I have to lie. If I don't, I'll ruin this friendship. That's not true. You have a choice. Sometimes you'll hear others say, well, everyone is cheating on the test, and besides, I have to cheat or I won't pass the class. That's a lie. You have the choice, and you do not have to cheat or plagiarize. Others would say, well, I I would give up this sin, but I just can't control it. That's another false truth. That's a lie. There's no truth connected with that whatsoever. Because we have the ability to choose. And hopefully instead of saying, I won't do this, hopefully we can change. Instead of saying, I can't do this, we'll understand that it's really that I won't. And that we would repent of all of those sins. And that we will start living for God and be a part of His holy nation, this royal priesthood, this elect that has a future in heaven. As a free agent living in today's world, you can choose to sign with God's team, the church who will be saved forever. Or you can choose to sign with Satan's team who will be lost forever. No one can make that choice for you. You must choose for yourself whom you will serve. This morning we are singing this song of invitation and we hope that everyone chooses God and to be an obedient man or woman of God, to believe in Jesus Christ, and to repent of sins and to confess faith and to be baptized into Christ, having all of your sins washed away.
And we hope and pray that all of us continue to choose to live for God each day by remaining faithful to Him. But if we can help you in any way this morning with your eternal choice that we all have to make, when you come forward while together we stand and sing.